Welcome to the History of Health Information Technology in the U.S., the High Tech Act. This is Lecture A, Regional Extension Centers and Workforce Training. The piece of legislation passed in 2009, known as the High Tech Act, was a landmark for both the promotion and funding for health information technology in the U.S. Changes in the U.S. over the past 50 years have paved the way for this legislation. This presentation will briefly review that history up to the point of high-tech's passage, and also identify the barriers to widespread health IT that still remain. We will describe the vision for high-tech, as well as its main provisions, and we will look at how the legislation addresses those barriers. The objectives for this unit, the High-Tech Act, are to discuss the barriers to adoption of health IT that the High-Tech Act is designed to address. Discuss how the following ARA high-tech requirements relate to previous developments in health IT. Certified electronic health records. Concept of meaningful use, including e-prescribing, clinical decision support, interoperability in HIE, structured documentation of quality measures, incentives to providers, education of clinicians, workforce development. Give examples of how the high-tech provisions support healthcare reform efforts. Discuss the overall vision for the effects of the High-Tech Act. About 40 years ago, when information technology was first used in healthcare, it was mainly used for billing and collections. Later, its use was broadened to other administrative uses. For the last 20 years or so, there has been limited but increasing use of health IT for clinical purposes as part of the process of patient care. Much of that use was in a few academic medical centers that had developed their own electronic medical record systems. But it is important to note that Veterans Administration hospitals were also early adopters of the technology. Hospitals began to put more emphasis on quality improvement beginning in the early 1990s. By the early years of the 21st century, in part as a result of a series of reports by the U.S. Institute of Medicine, or IOM, it was recognized that health information technology could be harnessed for healthcare quality improvement. You may remember that the Institute of Medicine, now known as the National Academy of Medicine, is a part of the National Academy of Sciences a nonprofit organization that provides advice on key medical issues. Information technology also was seen as a way to improve efficiency and reduce healthcare costs by reducing duplicate testing, saving time, and preventing medical errors. The IOM recommendations found a reasonably receptive audience, in part because there had been continuing efforts to make healthcare more systematic and more cost effective. In addition, the entire society was now more comfortable with using computers and technology in their daily lives. Patients were using the Internet for information and often would bring their doctors new information on their diseases. There was also improved and innovative technology in general, as well as in healthcare. These attitudinal and technological advances paved the way in 2004 for President George W. Bush to declare that his goal was for all Americans to have their data in electronic health records within 10 years. Unfortunately, it quickly became clear that there were still barriers to using health IT to improve quality and reduce costs. Let's take a look at these barriers. First of all, there was still low adoption of health IT especially in small physician practices. For these practices, the systems were perceived to be just too expensive. In addition, for all practices, there were concerns that just learning to use the systems would reduce their productivity in the short term, even if eventually they might show some cost savings. Finally, if health IT was really going to expand, it was clear that there was a shortage of support personnel trained in the use and implementation of health information technology who could work with the clinicians to implement the technology in an effective manner. Unfortunately, adoption alone without appropriate use is not likely to make an impact. If few physicians in a practice actually use the system, 
it is clearly not going to do much. Nevertheless, even if all physicians in a small practice used electronic medical records to document care practices, it is still likely to make only a limited impact on quality. Certainly, it will make information more accessible to the practice and will help legibility if others need to view the records. However, for small physician practices, where the local charts are easily accessible and handwriting is not a major problem, simple use may not do much. What is needed is to use the system in ways to make targeted quality and safety improvements. We will talk a little later about what those ways are. For the overall quality of care to be improved, the information must be able to be shared with others, so that when patients go to different doctors, they each have all the information they need. To reduce costs from duplicate procedures, the information must be shared between providers, and there are several barriers to information exchange. There is still a lack of agreement on the technical standards to use to share information between health IT systems. Many of you have seen examples in daily life of when format changes in technology occur and it takes a while for standards to be established. In healthcare IT, it has been humorously said that we like standards because there are so many from which to choose. But this lack of standards impedes information exchange. In addition, both health professionals and the general public have worried about the privacy and confidentiality of information if it is shared electronically. These concerns also have been a barrier to health information exchange. Another barrier is that the technology itself, while vastly improved over earlier systems, is still not perfect. Clinicians frequently complain that the systems are not geared for the way they think and work. In addition to the barriers previously mentioned in terms of technical standards for information exchange, we still don't have best practices for information exchange models. And finally, there are technical issues related to the security of information that will have to be addressed if there is to be widespread information sharing. A final barrier to the widespread use of health information technology to improve the quality and reduce the cost of health care was the lack of stable leadership necessary to accomplish the goals set forth in 2004. At that time, the President appointed Dr. David Brailer to be the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. However, presidential appointments are subject to political changes. For change on the scale envisioned here, there needed to be a more stable and sustained leadership arrangement. ARA is the abbreviation for the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, otherwise known as the Stimulus Package. This legislation was passed in 2009. Overall, ARA provided over $787 billion in funding. It included grants to states for infrastructure and jobs, and in healthcare, we saw increases in funding for research. There were many other provisions designed to both increase jobs and stimulate the economy. One of these provisions is the part of ARA known as the HITECH Act. HITECH stands for Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health. It provided over $19 billion in funding for health IT. Let's look at the vision for HITECH. If you look at the right-hand side of the screen, in the big red box, it shows the goals and vision for the effects of the HITECH Act. Improved individual and population health outcomes. Increased transparency and efficiency. Improved ability to study health care. And improved care delivery. Those are certainly lofty goals. The ways to get to the goals are in the middle column of boxes. They include increasing adoption and exchange of health information, which will support meaningful use of EHRs. This, as we have said, is critical. You will notice that all of these strategies to reach the goals have had significant barriers to achievement. So the first column describes some of the ways that high-tech plans to address the barriers. These include the following. Establishing regional extension centers to help providers implement health IT. Providing training to increase the health IT workforce, which will also assist providers in adopting EHRs. 
providing incentives through Medicare and Medicaid for meaningful use of EHRs. Medicare and Medicaid are major government payers for health care. And finally, promoting health information exchange by providing grants to states for developing methods of health information exchange and setting up frameworks to develop standards and certification processes for EHRs, as well as for privacy and security of the information contained within them. Let's look more closely at how the high-tech funding addresses the barrier of low adoption of EHRs by establishing health information technology regional extension centers and workforce training initiatives. The idea behind the Regional Extension Centers, or RECs, is to provide the support to help providers get started implementing EHRs. There were 62 funded RECs all over the country. They are supposed to be similar in principle to agricultural extension centers that employ experts who help farmers with farming problems. The REC would deploy staff to go out to the medical practices within their region to assist with a variety of issues around EHR implementation and meaningful use. While initial funding comes from the high-tech funding in the form of a grant, it was expected that within four years the regional extension centers would become self-sufficient. To some extent, that has occurred. However, remember when we said there was a shortage of qualified people with health IT expertise? To address this shortage, high-tech provided funding for what is called the Workforce Program. In addition to staff for the regional extension centers, it was clear that if the vision for greater EHR use was to be realized, more personnel of various sorts were needed. What types of personnel? Clearly we need more technical personnel who provide support and maintenance of these systems, and informatics professionals who can develop both new tools to promote meaningful use and better methods of information management. We also need people who can oversee the systems and the information exchange activities. And, in hospital settings in particular, we need clinicians to function as the liaisons between the other clinicians and the IT personnel. In collaboration with the Department of Labor and with health IT and informatics education experts, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology identified six new types of healthcare IT workers who had the kind of skills the RECs and others could use. These six roles include clinician consultants to work with the physicians and nurses in medical practices on how to implement their EHR to promote meaningful use. We also know from research that EHRs that fit into the office workflow are more likely to be used and used effectively. Workflow refers to the way the office and its personnel are organized, how they work together, and how each person goes through their daily tasks. So another role that is needed is a workflow redesign specialist who can analyze the workflow and recommend ways that the new EHR can be incorporated. To actually get an EHR up and running, an implementation manager and a support team are required. In addition to the mobile personnel who are part of the RECs, some permanent roles include trainers and technical support staff who would be needed on an ongoing basis. To train these different types of individuals, the high-tech funding supported five regional consortia of community colleges to develop six-month training programs. Each of the consortia has multiple collaborating community colleges. There are also five health information technology curriculum development centers who collaborated to develop the curricular materials that the community colleges used. In addition to the short-term programs in the community colleges, there were other roles identified that needed longer training programs at the university level. These roles included clinicians or public health experts for the public health setting who could function as IT leaders specialists who focused on health information exchange, as well as privacy and security specialists. Some of the roles that involved development of new technologies included research and development scientists and programmers and software engineers. A final role was designed for someone who is a specialist in one area, for instance, public health. Such a person might become a health IT subspecialist and focus on health IT related to their primary specialty. 
Nine universities received high-tech funding to expand or develop training programs for these roles. In addition to training IT personnel, the high-tech legislation also included a recommendation to educate health professionals, clinicians, and others about health information technology. There are still many features in clinician education that serve to promote resistance to high-tech goals. For instance, there is often a subtle or not-so-subtle expectation that the doctor should be an expert. Unfortunately, this philosophy can lead to resistance to the use of information technology for decision support. For example, the television show House models that view. Dr. House, for those of you unfamiliar with the show, is a model of an expert diagnostician. This recommendation of high-tech was acted on later than some of the others. In 2015, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT funded seven institutions to update the original curriculum materials developed earlier by the Curriculum Development Centers and to use the materials to develop training programs for practicing health professionals on the role of health IT in facilitating new approaches to care. In the second presentation, we will discuss the other high-tech initiatives. This concludes Lecture A of the High-Tech Act. In summary, we describe the barriers to use of health IT and how the High-Tech Act addresses them. We discuss the problems of low adoption from the point of view of the need for a skilled workforce to assist clinicians in adoption. We also learned that high-tech had provisions for regional extension centers and a robust workforce development program.